Chapter 6. The Adventures of Eustace. At the very moment the others were washing hands and faces in the river and generally getting ready for dinner and a rest, the three best archers had gone up the hills of the north of the bay and returned laden with a pair of wild goats, which were now roasting over a fire. Caspian had ordered a cask of wine ashore, strong wine of Achilan, which was to be mixed with water before he drank it, so there would be plenty for all. The work had gone well so far, and it was a merry meal. Only after a second helping of goat did Edmund say, Where's that blader Eustace? Meanwhile, Eustace stared round the unknown valley. It was so narrow and deep, and the precipices which surrounded it uh, were so sheer that it was like a huge pit or trench. The floor was grassy, through though strewn with rocks, and here and there Eustace saw a black burnt patches, like those you see on the sides of a railway embankment in a dry summer. About fifteen yards away from him was a pool of clear, smooth water. There was, at first, nothing else at all in the valley, not an animal, not a bird, not an insect. The sun beat down, and grim peaks and horns of mountains peered over the valley's edge. Eustace realized, of course, that that in the fog he had come down the wrong side of the ridge, so he turned back at once to see about getting back. But as soon as he had looked, he shuddered. Apparently he had, he had had, by amazing luck, found the only possible way down, a long green split of land, horribly steep and narrow, with precipices on either side. There was no other possible way of getting back. But could he do it now that he saw that it was what it was really like? His head swam at the very thought of it. He turned round again, thinking that, that at any rate he'd better have a good drink from the pool first. But as soon as he had turned and before he had taken a step forward into the valley, he heard a noise behind him. It was only a small noise, but it sounded loud in that immense silence. It froze him dead still where he stood for a second. Then he slewed round his head and looked. At the bottom of the cliff, a little on his left hand, was a low, dark hole, the entrance to a cave, perhaps. And out of this, two thin wisps of smoke were coming, and the loose stones just beneath the dark hollow were moving. That was the noise he had heard, just as if, someone, just as if something were crawling in the dark behind them. Something was crawling. Worse still, something was coming out. Edmund or Lucy or you would have recognized it as what at once, but Eustace had read none of the right books. The thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long, lead-colored snout, dull red eyes, no feather, feathers or fur, a long, lithe body that trailed on the ground, legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's cruel claws, bat wings that made a rasping noise on the stones, yards of tail, and the two lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things any better if he had. If he had. But perhaps if he had known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at how this dragon's behavior, at this dragon's behavior, it did not sit up and clap its wings, nor did it shoot out a steam of flames from its mouth. The smoke from its nostrils was like smoke of a fire that will not last much longer. Nor did it seem to have noticed Eustace. It moved very slowly towards the pool, slowly and with many pauses. Even in his fear, Eustace felt that it was an old, sad creature. He wondered if he dared make a dash for the ascent. But it might look round if he made any noise. It might come more to life. Perhaps it was only shamming. Anyways, what was the use of trying to escape by climbing from a creature that could fly? It reached the pool and slid its horribly scaly chin down over the gravel to drink. But before it had drunk, there came, there came from it a great croaking or clanging cry, and after a few twitches and convulsions, it rolled round on its side and lay perfectly still with one claw in the air. A little dark blood gushed from its wide open mouth. The smoke from its nostrils turned black for a moment, and then it floated away. No more came. For a long time, Eustace did not dare to move. Perhaps this was the brute's trick, the way it lured travelers to their doom. But one couldn't wait forever. He took a step nearer, then two steps, and halted again. 
The dragon remained motionless. He noticed, too, that the fire, red fire had gone out of its eyes. At last he came up to it. He was quite sure now that it was dead. With a shudder, he touched it. Nothing happened. The relief was so great that Eustace almost laughed out loud. He began to feel as if he had fought and killed the dragon, instead of merely seeing it die. He stepped over it and went to the pool for his drink, for the heat was getting unbearable. He was not surprised when he heard a peal of thunder. Almost immediately afterwards, the sun disappeared, and before he'd finished his drink, big drops of rain were falling. The climate of this island was a very unpleasant one. In less than a minute, Eustace was wet to the skin and half-blinded with such rain as one never sees in Europe. There was no use trying to climb out of the valley as long as this lasted. He bolted for the only shelter in sight, the dragon's cave. There he lay down and tried to get his breath. Most of us know we should, what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair, but, as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. That was why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Parts of it were too prickly to be stones and too hard to be thorns, and there seemed to be a great many round, flat things, and it all clinked when he moved. There was light enough at the, at the, cave's, at the cave's mouth to examine it by, and of course Eustace found it to be what any of us could have told him in advance. Treasure! There were crowns, those were the prickly things, coins, rings, bracelets, ingots, cups, plates, and gems. Eustace, unlike most boys, had never thought much of treasure, but as he, but he saw at once the use it would be to, use it would be in this new world which he had so foolishly stumbled into through the picture in Lucy's bedroom at home. They don't have any tax here, he said, and you don't have to give treasure to the government. With some of this stuff, I could have quite a decent time here, perhaps in Calorman. It sounds the least phony of these countries. I wonder how much I can carry that bracelet, that bracelet now. Those things are in it are probably diamonds. I'll slip that on my own wrist, too big, but, if, but not if I push it right up here above my elbow, then fill my pockets with diamonds. That's easier than gold. I wonder when this infernal rain's going to let up. He got into a less uncomfortable part of the pile where it was mostly coin and settled down to wait. But a bad fright, once and when it is over, and especially a bad fright following a mountain walk, leaves you very tired. Eustace fell asleep. By the time he was sound asleep and snoring, the others had finished their dinner and become seriously alarmed about him. They shouted, Eustace! Eustace! Cooey! Till they were horse and Casp Caspian blew his horn. He's nowhere near or he'd have heard that, said Lucy with a white face. Confound the fellow, said Edmund. What on earth did he want to slink away like this for? But we must do something, said Lucy. He may have gotten lost or fallen into a hole or been captured by savages or killed by a wild beast, said Drinian. And good riddance if he has, I say, muttered Rince. Master Rince, said Reepy Cheep. You never spoke a word that became you less. The creature is no friend of mine, but he is of the Queen's blood, and while he is one of our fellowship, it concerns our honor to find him and to avenge him if he is dead. Of course we've got to find him, if we can, said Caspian wearily. That's the nuisance of it. It means a search party and endless trouble. Bother Eustace. Meanwhile, Eustace slept and slept and slept. What woke him was a pain in his arm. The moon was shining in at the mouth of the cave, and the bed of treasure seemed to have grown much more comfortable. In fact, he could hardly feel it at all. He was puzzled by the pain in his arm at first, but presently it occurred to him that the bracelet which he had shoved up above his elbow had become strangely tight. His arm must have swollen while he was asleep. It was his left arm. He moved his right arm in order to feel his left but stopped before he could move, he had moved it an inch and bit his lip in terror for just in for just in front of him for just in front of him and a little on his right where the moonlight fell clear on the floor of the cave he saw a hideous shape moving he knew that shape it was a dragon's claw 
It, mo it moved as he moved his hand, and became still when he stopped moving his hand. Oh, what a fool I've been, thought Eustace. Of course the brute had been a mate, and now it's lying beside me. Of course the brute had a mate, and it's lying beside me. For several minutes he did not mare, dare move a muscle. He saw two thins of co he saw two thin columns of smoke going up before his eyes, black against the moonlight, just as there had been smoke coming from the other dragon's nose before it died. This was so alarming that he held his breath. The two columns of smoke vanished when he could no longer when he could when he could hold his breath no longer. He let it out steadily. Instantly, two jets of smoke appeared again, but even yet he had no idea of the truth. Presently, he decided that he would edge very cautiously to his left and try to creep out of the cave. Perhaps the creature was asleep. Anyways, it was his only chance, but of course, before he edged to the left, he looked to the left. Oh, horror! There was a dragon's claw on that side, too! No, no one will blame Eustace if at this moment he shed tears. He was surprised at the size of his own tears as he saw them splashing onto the treasure in front of him. They also seemed strangely hot. Steam went up from them. 